Chris. Half a day told us I'm so when I would do an STG on Otru episode for Natsu. Half a day. Half a day, everyone. This is another episode of Fanatsu. Gwawi host Mizu Tatlusi, Michael Luhan Bavakwa. I am once again your host. You've been, you've you've gotten some other wonderful hosts for the past few episodes. We had uh, Amara San Augustine who talked to Micah Manaitai, Micah Garrido. That was her first episode. Before that, we had Nicole Quintaniza and Annie Faye Camacho. And so it's almost sad that you have to come back to me after sort of a few weeks of of way more interesting and way cooler hosts to listen to. But I'm going to make up for that by bringing in some very, very sharp, very critical Gofmalati Natauta, who are going to be talking to us about something that affects everybody on Guam, whether or not they realize it. And so we're going to be talking today with uh, Matsalik Sindalu, Michael Phelps from Paratodusit, and then Yale grad student uh, Kira Bloss. And so militarized gentrification. That's the topic today. And um, military, we know what military is. We have a lot on Guam, but militarized, right? When we hear people talk about militarization, they're talking about sort of, uh, they're talking about it in a way that we can analyze the impact of the military on lives, on communities, on lands. And then when we get into gentrification, what could gentrification mean? We're going to talk about that. But today, this this concept is a really way of helping us think about the impact of the military presence on Guam and how it may negatively impact us, right? Where if, um, if you grew up on Guam, then you probably have seen a lot of posters which tell you about the glories of, the, of joining the US military. If you have been to a Liberation Day parade, you've probably heard people talk about the stories of how we owe our lives and our, our menyaina imanam kota, they owe their lives to the U.S. military, right? If you've ever, uh, what's it called? If you've ever had a big party, you have probably attempted to text your cousin who has base privileges to get you things cheaper on base for your party, right? And so we're thinking about the presence of the military here. You know, a lot of times we we we're fixated or we're people or sort of people focus us and our attention on the positives, much to the detriment of the negatives, of talking about the negative impacts that the military presence may have on our island. And so that's why this is the, what we're going to be talking about today is if you are low income, even if you are middle income, you know about militarized gentrification. If you've ever tried to rent houses, uh, rent apartments, and you feel like prices are so unaffordable, prices are going up. If you've ever had a landlord who you felt like they were trying to get rid of you so they could remodel their unit so they could rent it to somebody who could pay a lot more than you can, then you have experienced militarized gentrif gentrification. You have already come into contact with it. And so I'm excited that our guests today are going to really help us break down this issue, though, because if one third of your island is U.S. military facilities, if every year thousands of the community go into the U.S. military, if so much of our lives is dictated by military interests and we need to understand its impact on our lives, Right, we can't just sort of accept that that sort of all of this is explained by the Sam Sam, my dear Uncle Sam song. Right, we need to go a little bit deeper than that. And so, I'm so happy to have these two with us. Kazuhu Matsalik, first off, you represent a group Paratodus hit. And so, why don't you introduce yourself and then also introduce your group, Put for Bot? Of the day, Guamusi Matsalik with Paratodus hit. We're a mutual aid or we're, like we say, a Chanchuli collective uh, operating here, Giza Guahan. And uh, really it's just about community supporting community. That's what it comes down to. Uh, just trying to uh, implement uh, an alternative way of supporting each other outside of modes of capitalism um, where we, those who have give to those who need and you know, no questions asked, nothing else, you know, just community supporting community. That's it. Um, I will say it's been a while since we've been as active as we could be. Um, that's because 
our collective, all of our members are, well, uh, sick, chronically ill. Uh, we're uh, working peoples, working class, uh, neurodivergent uh, people on the spectrum. And so there's a lot of things going on right now that's keeping us from being able to be on the, on the, on the ground. Uh, but we are still here and, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be doing more soon. But, uh, you know, that's the thing about uh, what we do is we, we hope that people don't see us as an organization that kind of just has to pass through our hands um, and that people just continue to do it with each other. And honestly, it's encouraging because we've seen it. We've seen other groups come up. We've seen people just keep on doing exactly what uh, mutual aid is all about and what we have always had here on Guam, um, just our community supporting each other. And yeah, glad to see it happening still. And I, I loved it when, uh, when I saw Paratotos hit sort of first come out and the messaging, it was so nice because, you know, a lot of times we talk about sort of the strength of culture and community, but we also have to acknowledge that things have changed dramatically, that nowadays there's always this expectation that sort of like there's a government entity or there's a nonprofit or Uncle Sam or somebody is going to take care of us or going to make things happen for us, right? But when we look back, if we look back in the past, it was families, the community taking care of each other, right? And so I love the way that Paratotus hit didn't sort of, it wasn't like, you know, we're, we're, the, we're, we're one of those nonprofits, you know, it was more like, you know, we're, we're an outlet for facilitating the community to help, help each other. So just as we've come to expect that somebody else is supposed to do things, do these things for us, it was a way of encouraging people just to help each other. If you just need like a little bit of a boost, a little bit of a push to help each other. And so, Kof Maulik and Sidzus Masi, Matsalik. And so, Kira, put Fabot, this is your first time on Fanatsu. Thank you so much for joining. Put Fabot, go ahead and introduce yourself. Mafade, Bohusi Kaira. I am currently at Yale Law School, um, about to start my last year this fall. I'm so excited to be so close to the finish line. Can't wait to graduate. Um, I was born and raised in Guam. Um, and growing up, I feel like I was raised very um, colonized, you know? So I'm really grateful for the way that different paths that I've pursued in my life have led to this moment right here, being here on Fanatsu. So excited for this opportunity and also so nervous, but thank you so much. And it's great to meet you, Masalik, also. And I apologize for saying Kira, Kaida. No, no, don't even, it's fine. It's oh, no. such a common. I dispense it to dispense it to. Okay, but uh, again, all right, we have a nice converse, we have a nice crew here. And so this issue of militarized gentrification. And so Kaira, you're here because of course you had written a paper recently about this. So you've been conducting research on it. And then Matalik, you've worked in the community with people who struggle sort of with issues of gentrification, sort of the rising cost of living. And so Matalik, um, can you break down sort of when you when we're talking about either gen when we're talking about let's say gentrification first um because i also know that you have experience organizing around these issues in the states and so um break it down what is gentrification for people who may not be familiar with this way of talking about social uh, dynamics yeah so gentrification now yeah, that's um it, we we come across like big words all the time uh, because we have people making policies and writing academic papers who end up studying these things and they they make these big words um, and they don't really sound good or bad they're just these things so uh, when you experience it that's when when I don't know when it comes alive like you can explain it and but it's about experience so gentrification is it's a process it's not really like a thing that happened and that's where you're at so it can start and you don't realize it's happening and, and it 
finishes it and then everybody that lives there where it's been gentrified doesn't feel that it was gentrified because they were part of that process. So um, it's when you have one place uh, in the States, you know, we talk about neighborhoods, um, but here, like we're, we're talking about islands, entire islands, you know, a village. Um, and you have people that live there already, right? People who have lived there for a long time. Uh, and then you have sort of this process where things start getting bought, like buildings or, or spaces, they start changing them into uh, spaces where, where people with more money can come in. Um, and, and you get people from other places who do have more money who start moving there because they realize like the, the cost of living is lower or uh, there, there's other benefits to them being there because they have to work there or because, uh, you know, there's, it's closer to another place that they need to be at. Um, and so you start getting this thing where they trickle in with businesses, trickle in with more money, um, and it starts raising the cost of living. And the people that live there already suddenly find themselves no longer able to afford to stay where they've always been or have been for a very, very long time, decades, maybe even a hundred years, or in the case of our island, thousands of years. <laughs> and so they have to start leaving. And then this process, it just keeps going. It keeps pushing people out that have been there and, and more and more from outside start coming in. And that's why I said at the end of this process, you have all these people that are staying there that, that they don't see what the problem is because you know they don't identify themselves as part of the problem of gentrification and so they're like well you know it just made it better this neighborhood is nicer you know quote unquote less crime you know we got these nice restaurants this uh this bookstore or whatever you know um and it has happened everywhere um it feels like the entire city of, city of seattle <laughs> went under this process um but we see that here on Guam, uh, specifically with militarization. And that, I mean, that's the topic of what we're doing here. Um, so, you know, I'll just get it back to you. I, hopefully that wasn't a long-winded explanation. <laughs> no, 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 no. Go from Aule Canal. I, it's, it, it was good because you brought in a, a lot of the dynamics involved, right? Is that gentrification is sort of people getting pushed out, other people coming in. And it's, uh, but the people who come in, like you said, they often feel like, well, but but we made it nicer or we brought in money, we're giving back to the community, right? And so a lot of times there's just not this understanding that a lot of people got squeezed out, you know, that gentrification often happens in, in the places where people have the least resources to fight or they have the least the least voice to 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 push back, right? This is... You know, and and it used to happen sort of, you know, environmental justice uh, often talks about this, right? In the place where, where do uh, landfills end up? Where do freeways end up? Where does, where do public transportation lines end up? And that um, a lot of it just came down to where, where are the Native American reservations? <laughs> where do the poor people live? Where do those who cannot do anything about it live? And let's, let's just put it there. And then, but now we see it like it's even broader now because now it's sort of poor communities in urban areas sort of looking, you know, and it's not that you put something unseemly or unsightly there, but instead you put really nice vinyl record stores there. Ooh, and oh my goodness, you have these boutiques in which all the food is hand sculpted and they didn't use any meat, right? Vegan. Yeah restaurants it's all organic and it's all wonderfully crafted but uh but it so that's why it's uh, it's so yes no thank you so much for your explanation of it and so so Kyra I wanted to hand it off to you do you have anything to add sort of about this issue of gentrification or do you also want to just talk then about militarized gentrification like like sort of bringing that equation into it or bringing that into the into the equation Sure. Um, I think that um, a huge driving factor in the gentrification of our island back home is the military overseas housing allowance. Um, so by law, 
military service members are entitled to a housing allowance. Um, but it wasn't until I started researching for my paper that I realized that the housing allowance that service members get stationed on Guam is under a different program. It's under the foreign program versus what they would receive in any of the 50 states. Um, and the way that those housing allowances are calculated are also, they go through a different process. So um, because the foreign or overseas housing allowance doesn't take into account how much the, or how, yeah, how much the um, market rent rates are in the local community. Um, what we see on Guam is the military service members bringing their, bringing their housing allowances that are not based on local housing markets that are priced over $1,000 above what the market rates are. Um, we're seeing an influx of thousands of service members in these housing allowances just pushing out people in the local community. And because there's no legal or political um, legislative cap on or stop against this pattern of gentrifying our island um, and compounded by the military buildup that's, bring, that's rapidly bringing like even more like thousands and thousands of people here. Um, it seems like that process is the driving force of the gentrification on Guam, making it unlivable for people already here who have been here for thousands of years to continue to live here. I know that from reading your paper, one thing that drew you to this issue was also your own personal, your family's experience, right, in housing on Guam. And so I wondered if you wanted to share some of that. Um, yeah, I didn't ask permission to do this. So mom, please forgive me. Um, so uh, last year when I was thinking about what I wanted to write my paper on, I was talking to my mom and she needed to find new housing because our landlord who had been our landlord since I was like 14, um, she wanted to give the apartment that we had been living in to her son. So my mom could no longer live there. So then my mom was thrust into this super competitive, super overpriced um, housing market. And it was just, and my mom's a public school or she she's paid like a public school teacher salary. So um, as someone who's middle-class on Guam, it was just like almost impossible to find anything that was affordable for her that would also take our dog. <laughs> Oh yes, I think um, yeah, I know. I for me too. This uh, this issue has one that I've always been sort of, uh, especially since sort of the announcement of the build up, the military build up, like ten, fifteen years ago. It's always been on my mind. Something I've been critical of, but then once you have to enter into the housing market, or once the rental market, or once these factors like directly affect you, then sort of it becomes more real and raw because you can't you can't really ignore it. I mean, I've known so many people and I've experienced it too, where, you know, your landlord decides to just jack up your rate, your rental rate to get rid of you. Because, you know, there's this feeling that there's military renters out there who could pay so much more than you can. And so they just, they want you out. Because I, I, I stayed in an apartment for a, men, for a number of years and the landlord would never really fix or improve anything and then suddenly they wanted to raise the rent hundreds of dollars. And then once I left, oh, suddenly they're gonna fix everything. And they're gonna mm -hmm. charge, you know, they're gonna charge like seven, 800 more for the rent in, hoping of get, in hopes of getting like a, a, mili a military renter. And so, you know, Mat Matsalik, I wanna bring you back in here, especially as somebody who has, who has protested sort of issues of militarization, you know, who has spoken out, been very critical um, I want to hear your thoughts specifically on this issue of militarized gentrification. <clears throat> Man. So, I mean, obviously, uh, the overhouse or overseas housing allowance, the OHA, um, versus uh, what is the BAH? I forget what it stands for. That's the stateside mm -hmm. uh, allowance. So, uh, what, what I'm seeing, like what you're talking about, where they, they get this overseas allowance is they have a certain amount they can spend up to a cap, right? And they get reimbursed for it. 
So they're not, uh, it's not that they're given money, but they get reimbursed for it. But basically it's all covered for them. You know, it, it's given back to them. Um, and so it's kind of encouraged to, to spend as much as the, the, the limit will allow um, because they don't get to keep any of it, you know? It, it comes back to them, but they don't get to keep any of it. Any of it. So they're like, well, why not uh, just go for it? Um, and I was, I was read some articles too, where we talk about um, prime real estate on Guam. Uh, so like all the really nice recently renovated places, the ocean front, like kind of stuff like, um, but this, this honestly, uh, I feel like it's, it's kind of dishonest about describing what prime real estate is because it's just basically, it's in every village, you know, this prime real estate, it's in every village. It's any nice home or apartment. Um, it's geared toward getting those military prices like we're talking about, right? Like our, our landlords see the opportunity, they make some renovations and they shoot for that. So, but, but the market is geared toward getting that. And so they, they try and spend so much because, you know, they're like, oh, I'm not at home. I'm out in this tropical paradise, quote unquote. They want to live somewhere real nice. They want to have access to all the, the fun stuff that they have the money to spend on, you know, like all the restaurants and the bars and nightlife and going on these like hikes and uh, booze cruises and all that. So that's, they want access to all those things, right? So, hold on, I got lost in my own thought there. So, um, you, it's, you, know, you went on a mental booze cruise. You went on a booze <laughs> cruise. I, I, I saw it in your eyes. You were like, man, Lanya. <laughs> well, I've never been drunk in my life, but that was the closest I got. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so, I mean, it makes sense for them to want to do that, you know? Um, but what happens is all the real estate that's not great, you know? Um, places that are not taken care of, those are the places that locals that we can afford. Um, and uh, I don't know how to put this, like it just puts us in a situation where, you know, housing is not great or we don't have access to the things we should. Um, again, it, um, I think, uh, yeah, it, it, it changed. So it's kind of like, um, I mean, it's what we experienced like in the tour, you know, in sort of Guam being focused on tourism, right? Is who is the assumed person that we are taking care of the island for, right? It's like, we're oh, tourists, right? Not ourselves, not locals, tourists, right? It's the same thing with this housing market is the assumed person that you're supposed to be striving to rent to is not somebody who's from here, not somebody who lives here. So, so basically you have that massive gap, right? Where the units for locals are the ones that aren't taken care of because there's no incentive to, because people can't afford. So there's all, so you just have this massive gap. And it was like what, a, um, what we were talking about earlier, where, you know, if you're in the middle, you know, cause if you're, if you're sort of lower income, then there's at least some support from the government. There's different programs that you can appeal to, to get housing. Right. And, but then if you're kind of in the middle class, Ooh, you may be able to hear my child. That is not an ambulance driving through MTM. That is, that is, uh, that is my child that you might be able to hear. Who is, uh, who's practicing? She's going to audition for Spear. I hear, I hear hey, the great band called Spear. Bring it on. <laughs> bring it on. Come on over. <laughs> but um, I, I promised you I was going to tie it back in. <laughs> mouthing, mouthing. But um, so, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh no, I was I was just gonna jump right on what you're saying, because that's where I was headed. Is that it's not geared toward our our local people, and it ends up um, the other part of gentrification that we experience is that well, our if our standard of housing is lower, if our access to things is limited, you know, either we accept that we're just not going to have those things and we shoot for government assistance, right? which ultimately people that support militarization will throw back in our faces and say, well, those are federal dollars. You know, you're making it because federal dollars are supporting you and you wouldn't make it without it. And it's like, well, we have to have those federal dollars and the government 
forth because of the militarized gentrification we experience. You know, so you're telling us that we can't be against the military or militarization because we're getting federal support, but we have to get the federal support because of the militarization. So, it, you know, there's that. <laughs> but then there's also the part where if we really want to have those things, the better how standard of housing, the access, you know, to what our island is geared toward, the tourists and, and, and military, we have to then join the military. So, I, I mean, when I watch YouTube, right, I have all the ads turned off so it doesn't give me ads geared to my own, like, tastes, if you will, like what I'm looking at or all that. I would say literally 90% of the ads that I get on YouTube are military because that stuff's turned on. I get Air Force, Navy, and National Guard. Those are the ads I get 95% of the time, more than 90. I, it's like almost all of them. And when I look at why I get those ads, they say it's because of my location. So because I'm on Guam, I get recruiting ads almost exclusively. So, I mean, they put us in a situation where housing costs go up, you know, the, the higher standard of living, access to amenities and entertainment and, and resources, you know, goes to people who can afford it, which is namely, you know, the military and contractors um, for the military. And, and, and to get those things, we have to be them. We have to join them. And then you see this happen where, you know, when we, we sign up, then we PCS, you know, our people have to leave. And that is part of the push out, you know? We, we get pushed into these, like housing where there's a lower standard and then that gets grouped together, you know, all those places like are nearby or we leave, you know? That's the push effect that, but yeah, that's what that's what I was just getting asked. The other side of gentrification, where we either have to join the military or we we take the federal money. <laughs> mm, no, see, just mossy. And so, uh, so Kaida, you talk in your paper about sort of, and it, we've mentioned it already, sort of OHA versus what is it, BAH. Mm -hmm. And so I yes. wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that, because like you said that, you know, when you first encountered this subject, you sort of, you found out about, about the BAH, but then now sort of you realize that part of the problem is it's the OH, OHA, or wait, OHA yeah. housing allowance, okay. yes. And so yes, please uh, talk to more about that. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, so this the housing crisis on Guam became intimately tied to decolonization for me, like almost immediately, um, because it just seemed like another instance where the federal government uses our in-between status of foreign, not foreign, to put the people on Guam in a bad position for their own imperialist gain. And, and so in the domestic program, the BAH, the Basic Allowance for Housing, uh, the way that it's calculated is based on income level of the um, person in the military, their rank, whether they have dependents, and the local housing market. So because it's based on the local housing market, it kind of combats this, gen this gentrifying effect of having an influx of military members. And um, they can, so let's say someone who's like an E1 makes like $20,000 a year, they're put into this category of like a one or bedroom, one or two bedroom apartment based on if they have kids or not. And um, they're compared to civilians in the same area who are in the same income bracket and how much they pay in rent. So that's, so that average amount, that's how their housing allowance is set. Um, so it, in the States, it wouldn't have the same gentrifying effect on the community because of how the rates are calculated. Whereas on Guam, it's not, it doesn't take the local housing market prices or like what locals can afford into account at all. It's just based on surveys that are filled out by service members. So then, so they just ask all the service members, how much are your rents? And if the service members are all renting like um, luxury apartments that are, you know, on the beach, in Tumon, of course their rents are gonna be like $3,000 or like $2,000 or something like that. 
So because all their survey responses are geared towards these luxury real estate housing, that's what sets the allowance that they're getting. So that's why they continue to dominate the housing market. So instead of just being able to compete in the housing market, they're completely pushing out the competition from any local who's trying to enter the housing market also. Um, and also a crucial difference between the overseas housing allowance that they get on Guam versus one that they get in the States is that military members can actually pocket the difference between their rent if they're in the States. So if you're in California and you're incentivized to seek a like lower cost rent so that you could have that extra like $500 of tax-free income, you know, but on Guam, um, you don't have that same incentive. So of course you're gonna be trying to shoot for the most fancy real estate that you could possibly afford and max out that housing allowance because you're not able to pocket the difference. So this housing allowance is just one instance in a long pattern, of the United States, you know, picking and choosing when to classify Guam as domestic, when to classify Guam as foreign. Um, that's just completely screwing over the local population. No, thank you for bringing the connection into our political status, because um, so it it's, you know, I think that decolonization and political status are more talked about and more freely discussed than they have been sort of in at, at any time, probably since uh, San Vitoris was still alive and Harau and Matapeng were fighting against him or something like that. Right. And so. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's you know, good that it's it's out there, but a lot of people still don't understand that one of the reasons why we we should decolonize. And I have my personal preferences, but you know, if you think about getting us to independence, free association, statehood, all of them would put Guam in a different position in terms of this militarized housing issue, right? So, and you know, I have my preferences, but I always encourage people that whatever you support. If it's statehood, free association, independence, then you should know what it's gonna, what it, what it will bring to the island, right? What the impact will be. You should do your research about it. But a lot of people don't understand the role that our status plays in this, right? That it, if we were included within the United States, if we were excluded, right? Then it's a, it's a totally different thing, right? So um, because if you look in other countries, if you were, you know, if you use the overseas housing allowance like that at least you are also part of a, you're part of an independent country, which then has some sort of treaty or diplomatic relationship with the United States. Also, you also have laws against foreign nationals that are, that are there as well. You can, you can put taxes on them. You can do other things to them, right. In order to mitigate any potential costs, uh, because that's, you know, we, we see that in, in, uh, in communities like in South Korea, um, in Japan and Okinawa, where they too see the impact of like, um, you know, like 20 something year olds with a pocket full of OHA money, <laughs> you know, getting the really nice places and then also driving out locals from around bases. So they experience it too, but at least there's the layer of sovereignty involved in that. And so, um, but yes, I wanted to share this too. And so Kyra, if you could respond to this because, you know, people need to understand that this is, you know, that this is happening. You know, this is not something in the past. This is happening right now. This is from the PDN earlier this year. We're just reporting on how Camp Blas, the building of Camp Blas, driving up rental costs, right? And so this is, and so, uh, Kyra, if you could comment first and then Matsalik as well, because we're always so conditioned to think of more military means more money for the island that, oh, you build more bases, that means we're all going to get rich, right? Imagining sort of that every, every, every new base is like everyone gets a new golden ticket to the, to the Charlie's Willy Wonka, whatever that guy's name is, chocolate factory, right? But then we all get diabetes really quickly and we all die. Oh, anyways, dispense it. So, so Our next episode. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but so can you talk about this? Because I think people don't make the connection, right? So sure, you bring in more military and maybe uh, it's great for people that, that are renting to the military. Maybe it's great for the indirect spending that they do outside of their base, outside of their fences, right? 
But then imagine then the cost for everybody who suddenly has no means for addressing dramatic increases in their cost of living. And so, uh, Kyra, put if you don't mind, put forward, if you could share your thoughts on this. Yeah, so um, obviously when with the thousands of Marines that are coming to Guam, they're all bringing their individual housing vouchers, which will just exacerbate, exacerbate the gentrific gentrification problem on Guam. And um, I, and I think that in the States, the base, base housing is occupied at like 90% or something, but then on Guam, it's like half empty because they're so heavily incentivized to engage in the local housing market because why would you live on base if you could live on the beach in Tumon? And, um, and with the buildup, it's my understanding that they're monopolizing a lot of the construction resources on Guam. So while they're constructing these bases, they're also preventing locals from from affordable, from creating affordable housing initiatives and be, being able to build up more affordable housing because they're monopolizing all these construction resources. Um, so it just seems like the military is moving forward with their plans to bring all these individuals to Guam in furtherance of like their own agenda without adequately addressing how it's going to be impacting the local community. And it seems like very fast and very rushed and 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 without the proper processes and initiatives to also counteract that rushed influx of thousands of people on the island. So in terms of like our infrastructure, our housing market, et cetera. Um, yeah, and I was like a little kid when this agreement was reached. I was like nine or something when the military decided that they were going to bring like 40,000 people to Guam. And every time I, I lived there my whole life and left the island for the first time when I was 18. And every time I come home, it's just, you could just feel, you could see the difference. You can see the difference in housing. You could see like the jungles that I used to play in just completely demolished. Like, and you can feel the cultural difference on the island. Um, and I don't know. That was just a little rant, but yeah, I'm. Oh no, no, it's no, it's very relevant Africa. because no, it, it's it's very relevant and Sidus Masi because I think, and and it it's good that we 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 address and we acknowledge this because I think for the longest time, Chamorros felt compelled to give up as much of our island as quickly as possible to become as Americanized as possible. So if it meant not speaking tomorrow to your children. Well, that was good because you were supposed to bring English into the home. If it meant selling the land and moving to Las Vegas, that was good because that was better than staying here, right? And if it meant, you know, whatever our path to Americanization, it was always so fast. That's why I remember every time, what's it called? Like a new, uh, like a new franchise opened up. Ooh, Chili's. Yay! Oh my goodness! And I'm like, man, we already got plenty of chili on Guam, night. Right? We got donkulun chili. We got dikiki chili. We got chili that no one wants. We got chili everyone's after. We got esta mega chili guini, night. What do we need a, a place called Chili for? You know. Well, um, what you were saying also just reminded me. Um, with the gentrification, you know, like it is. It is a housing issue, but it's also an environmental issue. It's also a cultural issue because when you're getting pushed off island, you're also losing access to all of our like cultural resources that we have on the island, you know? And even in terms of like the military building the new base, like if they were to also very quickly build new housing to accommodate all those thousands of military personnel coming on island, like they probably also wouldn't be paying attention to the environmental impacts as we saw in the environmental impact statements for the base and the new facilities. So it's just a huge, a huge mess where lots of people are making big decisions that are impacting the entire island without actually caring about those impacts. Don't get it. That's a, it's an important reminder. We think about Uncle Sam, we think about the military as being our partner on the island. And sometimes they'll have very nice photo ops 
with the governor, the Maga Haga, standing next to the rear admiral. And, oh, they look so friendly and chummy. I bet they share kadu together sometimes, right? But is the military really our partner on the island? They have their own interests, right? They have their own missions. And so they will sort of, as part of their public relations, they will they will be very friendly. They will say, in Afa Maulik, at least they'll try to say it, they will say, you know, speaker, you're 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 my chalu, you're my you're my chalu speaker, you know, <laughs> governor, you're my chalu, that's that you're my you're my gay chung. They'll say stuff like that if you know, to sort of build that spirit. But at the end of the day, we see that they have their own interests, and that we cannot count on them to take our interests into account. We cannot count on them thinking about sort of what's best for us, and so. I want to, I actually, because you're bringing up sort of environmental impacts and larger development, and a lot of people have been experiencing or at least recognizing these um, processes through sort of some of the larger developments that have been proposed for the island. So a few years ago, there was like the Pago Bay, the Pago Bay development, which was uh, stopped, Biba Save Southern Guam and other groups for, for challenging that. And then recently we've learned that they, they plan to build like a giant Ferris wheel on Two Lovers Point or something like that. No, I'm just kidding. Underneath, <laughs> but I think, I think the plan was to have a, a water slide that went all the way down Two Lovers Point and stuff. And then, and then maybe you come out into like a, I don't know, like a human remains graveyard and you can jump off a latte or something like that. I don't know. But, um, but so Matalik, I want to hand it off to you though, because, you know, when, we see more and more a willingness in the community to speak out against these sorts of large projects. And I think one of the reasons is people recognize that this is not for the community. That could, like this Vista Del Mar project, the, your average person isn't gonna be renting there. Your average person can't afford something there. But with all of us that how we are struggling, why would we need that? Why would we want that? And so I wanted to hear your thoughts on that because we see in the community more of a willingness to, to speak out against these sorts of things. I mean, it's so incredibly obvious these things are not for us. Uh, I mean, going back to uh, talking about the percentage of you know housing on the base that is actually lived in by the military personnel, um, I think it's if you rank E4 or or above, you're encouraged to seek off base living situation. Um, it's it's actually encouraged. So uh, with this uh, Marines coming over, uh, you know that there's going to be many of them that are going to be living off base, and so that's what these developments are geared toward. As they're they're looking at the incoming population of of money you know, um, of the personnel that's going to be able to afford those things. That's what they're looking at. This, these housing, they're not being built for locals. It's not, a, you know, it's not here for us to have more places to live as the population grows on Guam. It's so that population that's coming in can take those, you know, these new places. Um, and you can see it happening on, uh, uh, all the way, it reverber reverberates all the way down to people who don't even have places to live. Our houseless population, for example, you see uh, this influx of uh, military personnel coming in for the Marine base for Camp Los, um, and the the realtors, the landlords, the, the landowners, they already know it's coming, um, and they're they're gearing up for that, you know. Uh, and they're, they're, they see this market as something where they can make a lot of money. And it's particularly interesting after a pandemic when we've had so many people struggling to make any money at all and to afford places to live. Um, you know, the eviction moratorium was lifted last year, so everybody can get evicted. Um, we, we have situations like, um, I believe they're looking for a transitional housing that they were going to build and they found a place finally the government of Guam and because it was government money uh, they were shopping around looking at places and the the, the building owners these landlords and, and realtors were asking for anywhere from two to four times the amount that was listed on the MLS because they knew it was government money but 
I mean, that's their expectation is that they're going to make money. It's not about housing the local people. It's about making the money off these uh, housing. Allowances has, um, and these new developments are all part of that too. You know, we we're we're getting choked out. You know, our our housing po our houseless population is they're even having a, a struggle to to help them. You know, people who already don't it's heartbreaking really and the fact that so many people have been conditioned to think that militarization is good for our island because it brings money i mean that's because the loudest voices in our community are the people that get the money you know they they are able to put their voices out in the media uh they have lobbying going on uh i mean it just it's very heartbreaking but that's also why we do what we do is in our communities um paratoris hit we started because we saw that you know there's needs and and nobody else is going to do that for us you know we could get help but you know from these agencies we can get help from you know charities nonprofits but it, it's us we have to do this for ourselves you know um and it's going to be the same way with this this housing you know um we need to start taking care of ourselves, but more importantly, we need to start centering the focus on what we need. Um, this housing market is not geared toward local people. And we need uh, everybody all across the board, our legislators, our landlords, um, and those of us in our community that are seeking housing to say we matter most, you know, like this is this is our land, this is where we live. And I mean, uh, what's what's, what's really strange is many of us can't even afford to leave <laughs> you know <laughs> um and so when we get pushed out where are we gonna go when we can't even afford to go you know so we need to think uh maybe a little more critically sometimes you know <laughs> uh, not listen to this idea that it's a boon for us you know that all this money means money for locals and in our pockets because it really doesn't um yeah, no, I guess that's all I got to say. Rant. No, no, thank you for that. Because <laughs> I see, um, I think during the pandemic, you know, we saw that there was this strong tension between people who were saying, open everything because we need to make money versus others who were saying that it's okay if we need to close things for a little while because we need to stay safe. And I remember that some of the people who were the most vitriolic the most aggressive to sort of the Magahaga and to leaders who are feeling like we should lock down or we should sort of, you know, that we should keep as safe as possible. And a lot of it were, um, you know, realtors, <laughs> you know, realtors, people who were feeling, like you said, that the eviction moratorium was messing with their profits, was messing with their ability to, to make more money. And, you know, I think, um, it's so unfortunate because when we talk about sort of like island culture, island values, you know, we have to acknowledge that you can embody those things just by wearing a Aloha print shirt, right? Or you can acknowledge it by, ooh, you say half a day to people or, oh, maybe you put spam on everything. I don't know, right? Maybe you, whatever way you express it, right? But fundamentally... Island values are not about making profits over people's lives. Fundamentally, in the most powerful and most important way, you know, it is about community, sustaining, protecting, taking care of each other. That's what island values are. But we have all of these forces. And as you said, they're the loudest. They have the most money. Um, they certainly spend way too much time on Facebook. Um, because because uh, I always hear from them or I always see them, right? Yes, we do. And so and and they're kind of I hate to say it because it's kind of cliche, but they 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 are fighting and in some ways they win in the soul in the fight for the soul of the island, 
what is this island going to be? Is it one where Inafa Maulik is something real that protects us, that helps us, that keeps us safe? Or is it just going to be like a word that people use when they want to silence activists? That, oh, you know, by protesting us, by, by interfering with our ability to make money, that's not enough a maulik. And so, and so, um, so Kyra, I wanted to, to hand it back to you, though, because we're, we're getting pretty heavy, but it's important because these are very heavy issues because, and it's important that we bring it together because thousands of people every day on Guam struggle with these things. And the disconnect in which sort of the more money in which certain groups make the harder it is for other people to survive. Like we have to make these connections, especially in an election year, you know, where you have people running to basically say they're going to help the community, but then they're also probably the ones that are renting out houses to the military. They're yeah. the ones that have the most interest in protecting this system, right? And so, so I wanted to, to give it to you though, to think what, what are some ways, what are some ideas that we might address this? Um, and it's, this is especially important because you talked about sort of local leaders, um, lack of action sort of on this issue. And so what, what can we think, what, what, what can be done? Um, so I think one thing would be, one thing that's very important is I think like increasing awareness and education on the issue. I think that it's a huge problem that needs to get, that needs to be attacked from all sides. So I think that the military should change its policies. And at least in the meantime, while Guam's still a territory, like include us in the domestic housing allowance program, because I think that it would um, have less harmful of an effect than the overseas one that we're currently on. I think the legislature should also enact some rent control legislation or um, expand the Section 8 voucher program, like allow more people to be eligible to join, increase the number of vouchers available, um, more affordable housing needs to be built. It needs to be more than the luxury housing being built and maintained. I think the military should, and this is something that my partner Kevin um, brought up to me is that the military should be renovating the buildings that they already have, the, the homes and apartment buildings that they already have, and have people live in those. Um, and as Metallic mentioned earlier, like military members, they're incentivized to live off base, they're encouraged to live off base. I think that the military should require that all of their on base housing gets completely occupied first before they even start engaging in the, in the local housing market. Um, and if anyone's ever been on base, like, you know how expansive and spread out that, that land is, like, they have so much open, like, they have, like, gigantic open fields, and they should really just, like, if they're not going to be giving the land back, they should be utilizing the land that they already have instead of encroaching on the land that we have off base that is still accessible to the local population. Um, they, I also think that like an external auditor should be the one setting the housing allowance standards. I don't think that the military should just be setting it themselves. I don't think that they should be trusted to do that. <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess those are, and. I think that it's on, it's also on the military, like, yes, they can use their housing allowances to the max amounts if they wanted to, but they could also bargain down their rent rates and, and help push the rent rates back down to an affordable amount. Like they could not buy homes on Guam, you know, they could rent from local landlords, they could um, educate their friends that are also in the military um, they could give mutual aid to orgs like Paratotus Hit that are helping individuals in the community be able to afford to continue to live here. Um, yeah, those are just some some of my thoughts on this huge, huge problem. Oh no, don't worry. I mean, it's it it is huge. Sidus <laughs> Masi for your for your input. 
I mean, and and Dor I mean, it's it's not something that we can solve, unfortunately, in this conversation. But if we can get more people to understand the structure of this, like if you could, you know, if um, because a lot of times this idea of affordable housing is just something that Republicans and Democrats on Guam throw it back and forth at each other, depending who's in power and and stuff like that. When in truth, both parties benefit a lot from this system. That's why you should take into account who's renting, who's got properties to rent, right? This is this has always been one of the the big things that I always like to remind people about the military buildup is it's not that Guam is going to make billions of dollars and make so much money. It's not that Guam is not going to make any money. It's that those who already have a lot will get more. Those who don't have a lot will struggle and probably have to deal with less. That the buildup will bring a windfall to those who have the ability to take advantage, who have the ability to get subcontracts for the big projects, or have the ability to get take advantage of the OHA. Everyone else will struggle with more traffic on the roads, longer wait times at hospitals, increased rent, right? More supply chain shortages, <laughs> right? Like all of these yeah. things. So that's that's part of the problem is that um, we have to think of this at that structural level. We have to bring political status into the equation. So this is not just an issue that, oh, you know, affordable housing, this or that. It's like, yeah, there is this structure because of our political status, because of our relationship or lack of relationship to the military, where it just drives those who are struggling into even further desperation. And that's why, you know, for me, all of the, the media truth seekers out there who like to talk about government corruption and stuff like that, but don't call out this system at all. You know, especially now in this election, people saying, oh, you know, the haves and the have nots. But, you know, it's just unfortunate because there's real systemic issues going on here. And I wish that more in the media would actually talk about these types of issues and what we can do about these issues and encourage the community to, to, to do something, to stand up, to organize, to mobilize about these sorts of things. But I want to give um, each of you just a final chance to sort of share some of your thoughts. Hugo Fagradesi Hamzu, I appreciate both of you joining. But so, Matsalik, um, maybe Hugo Finetna, you go first. So, uh, final thoughts on this issue, and then also some reminders about Paratodos hit, if you'd like. Okay. Uh, hey, Sijus uh, Masi, for having me on, and Sijus uh, Masi to uh, Kyra. Uh, appreciate and respect to you. Thank you for what you, you've said and what you're doing. Um, look forward to what you're gonna do in the future. Um, yeah, I mean, final thoughts on this. Uh, I, I wanna say that I, I will probably not have any final thoughts. That's it. Because for me, a final thought is like, you know, I've got this all figured out and summed up. Uh, or there's like a last thing that I want to add that's a good punch. But really, this is something that, like I said, with gentrification is a process. And I don't know, maybe my final thought in, in true mixed up my brain is a, scatter, a scatterbrain fashion. I'll say my final thought is that we should always be thinking about this. We should always be analyzing everything going on. Um, if I'm gonna say something, maybe say something ridiculous that uh, you know I like to offer up uh, ideas for solutions that are maybe uh, obtuse or whatever. <laughs> don't maybe this year since it's election season, don't vote for anybody who holds uh, who who holds rental properties. So if you're looking for a politician to vote for, uh, vote first for everyone who doesn't actually own any rental property. No landlords, no landlords. Twenty twenty two. Or or don't don't vote for anyone who also owes uh, 
tens of thousands of dollars in Gura back payments when they were uh, unethically or inappropriately a Gura landlord, or perhaps their father was. It's kind of unsure. Who knows? I only believe. I see. I only believe what Facebook tells me, and and apparently, he's totally uh, innocent. <laughs> completely. Com completely, totally exonerated. All right. And so Sidus Ma Masi Matalik, I mean, you know, that's I love that because there's all these candidates that are running who talk about take the power back to the people, talk about, oh, let's revolutionize this, you know, and some of one of them is, of course, Mr. Ken Leon Guerrero, our favorite, you know, our favorite oh, person yeah. who was formally disallowed from from getting federal contracts. And so, you know, it's like... <sighs> It's just empty rhetoric. If you really want to fight against the system, then something like what you're saying is the case. Don't vote for anyone who has a vested interest in keeping the system that, that keeps the majority of people on islands struggling to survive. Something like that is radical. Not like, oh, I'm going to vote for Republicans this year instead of Democrats. Or, oh, I'm going to vote for the guy who boosted the most Facebook posts this year. I'm going to vote for the guy who probably wishes, who probably dresses up like the founding fathers <laughs> for Halloween, right? <laughs> those are not yeah, radical no, things. <laughs> oh, <laughs> those are not radical things. But so, but Sidus Masi for that, because that is something that would definitely upset the system is to sort of mobilize against that. If you own this, if you own properties and you are making money off the system, how can you be trusted to keep the interests of those who who aren't giving you that money, who don't have OHA. And so, Kyra, I want to also ask you your final thoughts on this. Sure thing. Um, well, first, I wanted to say, like, thank you both so much. This is so fun. I was so nervous in the beginning, and I just feel like I'm just chatting with friends. Um, and to anyone listening, like I know that we pre-recorded this. So if you wanted a link to my Google Doc that has a paper on it, or if you have any questions for me, you could email me at Kyra, K-Y-R-A, Bloss at gmail.com. Um, and even if, and if you disagreed with anything that I said, or if I missed anything, like I'm not living on Guam, so I'm sure I missed stuff. So <laughs> feel free to email me and let me know. Um, yeah, I guess final thoughts. Um, so my whole time that I've been in law school, I've kind of been picking classes and picking papers and running down questions based off of our community, you know, like what are problems I see on Guam affecting the people that I care about, you know, and like what are some potential solutions to the problems that I can see. And I am I really hope that when I move home, I can be part of this movement, you know, with, um, with people in our community who are fighting for each other, you know, prioritizing each other and our, and our island and preserving it for future generations. Um, and for me, this housing crisis on Guam is, it's like one part of the colonial machine, you know, that needs to be, the entire thing needs to be dismantled. Um, and it's intimately connected to our status as a colony, to the Jones Act making like another federal legislation, making um, the cost of every import unaffordable. And it's intimately tied to the federal government taking land from outlawing our island or outlawing our language and um, and indigenous removal policies like within the continental United States. So like all of those things feel very like intimately related to me. And um, I just, it's such a huge problem. And I think that we have so many intelligent, talented people on the island who are, you know, have different interests and are intelligent in so many different ways. And I think if we all just come together, we could totally dismantle this evil machine together. <laughs> um, and I'm so excited to connect with 
More and more people. Biba, si Drus Masi. I mean, I I feel like I've been involved in these conversations for like 20 years now, and and I definitely feel like there's a lot more potential than there was in the past, at least. But perhaps that's me just feeling optimistic as I get older, which is surprising because I usually feel more pessimistic as I get older. <laughs> but Sidus Masi, Kaira Matsalik, Sidus Masi Nu Hamzunados, the Zahunaina Basing Aning Hamzuni Ume Egads and Ume Ekongok, Sidus Masi Nu Hamzulokin, Parein Egads and Ekongok Estina episode Fanatsu. Thank you all for tuning into this episode of Fanatsu. And now, how para pago? Adios. Estekimanali hitalo.